Ciao zusammen. Ciao zusammen. Herzlich willkommen zu einer weiteren Ausgabe des Cloud Native Bern Meetups. Ich schere meinen Screen. Geht gleich einen kleinen Moment. So. Genau, November 2020. Ähm, zur Aufwärmung haben wir eine kleine Umfrage schon vorausgeschickt. Ähm, ich präsentiere hier die Resultate. Äh, wo befindest du dich im Moment? Hätte nicht erwartet, dass zu Hause die meiste Antwort, die häufigste Antwort ist, aber es ist natürlich verständlich. Äh, ja, genau. Wir haben noch zwei weitere Fragen. Äh, die zweite Frage ist, was ist eure bevorzugte Zeit für ein Meetup? Welche Stunde würde euch am besten passen? Wir werden das für das nächste Meetup, virtuelle Meetup aufgreifen und euch entsprechend nach euch richten. Und dann haben wir noch eine dritte Frage, äh, die werden wir dann auch ähm, aufbereiten. Welche Themen möchtet ihr gerne an einem nächsten Meetup sehen? Was interessiert euch besonders? Da sind wir natürlich auch froh auf oben Input von euch, also aus der Community. Gut, gehen wir weiter. Heute haben wir ein besonders spannendes oder lustiges Thema, finde ich. Geschichten sind doch immer spannend. Es geht um Kubernetes Failure Stories. Kurz unser Setup. Wir sind mit den Speakern, also das OK ist mit den Speakern in einem Zoom-Call drin. Das streamen wir dann via OBS auf den YouTube-Livestream. Zwischen den Talks haben wir einen Handover von ca. 60 Sekunden. Da bitten wir euch dabei zu bleiben. Wir benötigen diese Zeit, um alles entsprechend hinter der Bühne, hinter dem Vorhang aufzusetzen. Wenn ihr Fragen habt, könnt ihr das gerne über den YouTube-Chat stellen. Wir werden den beobachten und das dann an die Speakers zurückfeeden und diese Fragen entsprechend stellen. Ja, dann das OK. Letztes Mal hatte ich noch ein altes Foto drin und wir sind auch gewachsen seit dem letzten Mal. Ich begrüße recht herzlich äh, Mathis Kretz und, und Tobi Furimann von Bispinion sowie Reto Lehmann von CodeMint, die uns hier unterstützen. Ihr seht, wir sind recht breit abgestützt. Eine große Community und es macht wahnsinnig Freude, das äh, zu moderieren und euch hier auch zu begrüßen. Ihr erreicht uns via Twitter über @cloudnativebern oder Hashtag CloudNativeBern. Da haben wir natürlich auch besonders Freude über Tweets und weitere Followers. Ja, unsere Mission etwas neu aufbereitet von Engineers für Engineers. Get your hands dirty und aus der Region für die Region. Dann noch etwas in eigener Sache. Wir haben ein Sponsoring-Kit aufbereitet für virtuelle Meetups, weil wir da nicht mehr so gut gehostet werden können. Für, fünf, für 500 Franken werdet ihr als Exklusivsponsor gemeldet. Wir werden verwenden dieses Geld, um die Speaker Gifts zu finanzieren und wir werden euch auch erwähnen auf unseren Social Media Kanälen. Und ich darf hier auch schon den ersten virtuellen Sponsor nennen. Das ist Postfinance. Vielen Dank für die Unterstützung unserer Community. Und wir gehen auch gleich weiter mit der Agenda. Ich bin Johann Giger vom OK. Ich begrüße euch hiermit recht herzlich. Und wen haben wir auf der Agenda? Wir haben als erstes Boris und Thomas von der Postfinance die uns über Self-Managed Kubernetes und was damit schief gehen kann, etwas erzählen werden. Dann Thies Kretz und Tobi Vorimann über Istio Failure Stories. Und dann haben wir Daniel Lorch, der uns über, über weitere, äh, Kubernetes, eine weitere Kubernetes Failure Story erzählt. Und last but not least, Oleg, auch von der Swisscom, nochmals Kubernetes in Production, was damit schief laufen kann. Ja, und es gibt einen Ausblick. Wir haben schon unser nächstes Meetup in der Pipeline am 19. Januar. Ab 17 Uhr würde ich sagen. Ich glaube, das war die beliebteste Zeit. Wird uns Robin Wies von Dynatrace etwas über Captain, Captain erzählen und dann der Christian Jakob von Chaos über Citadel. Und wir hätten auch noch einen dritten Slot frei. Also wenn jemand sonst noch etwas vorstellen möchte, wir haben so eine bis eineinhalb Stunden äh, Slots, also äh, Gesamtzeit zur Verfügung. Und das wäre es auch schon von meiner Seite. Ich möchte da nicht zu lange werden, damit wir genügend Zeit haben für, für die Speakers. Und wir benötigen jetzt etwas Zeit und sind gleich wieder zurück mit dem ersten 
entsprechenden Talk. Vielen Dank. Self-managed Kubernetes, what could possibly go wrong? Today, Thomas and I are going to talk about our journey with self-managed Kubernetes, which started approximately two years ago, more on that later. During this time, we had to solve a few challenges. As you can imagine, these two years did not go by without any operational issues. And that's what we are going to talk about today. We prepared a short presentation with two operational issues we faced during our journey. Thomas and I are both system engineers and working mainly on the Kubernetes infrastructure at PostFinance. For further information, you can write directly into the YouTube chat down below or contact us directly. Let's start with some background information about an, our environment spiked with a bit of history why we went the hard way with self-managed Kubernetes. First, a bit of history, how Kubernetes evolved at PostFinance. I think this fits the, the topic uh, failure story quite well, even if it's not a usual such story. It all started back in 2015 with OpenShift 3.0. The reason for uh, choosing OpenShift was its maturity compared to Kubernetes back in that time. Shortly after initial engineering efforts were made, some production workload was already running on our fresh installed OpenShift cluster. Nevertheless, OpenShift had its own issues. Uh, for example, the Red Hat Ansible playbooks were unusual in an air-gapped environment. We also faced a few bugs in OpenShift. Um, for example, there was uh, one bug regarding IPAM where we had to manually edit uh, etcd bitmaps by hand to, to fix it. And last but not least, there were some uh, operational issues, mostly caused by a workload which was simply not container ready. In May 2018, our engineering efforts to provide a vanilla Kubernetes platform were started with the aim to address our OpenShift issues. Kubernetes won an election against its uh, competitors like Cloud Foundry, which is now also based on Kubernetes, and Docker Swarm and Enterprise, which is now yeah, more or less time. Um, Kubernetes won because of its grown maturity and the good extensibility it provides. The setup we had was uh, completely custom. We even built the RPMs to distribute the binaries ourselves and used a lot of Ansible scripts to automate the entire cluster setup. Um, various things were improved. And due to our uh, house monkey, which was deployed in the, in the cluster, also in production, we made sure that only container-ready workload was run inside the cluster. Adoption of new platform grew and we were confronted with an old issue in a new way, our highly segmented network. Unfortunately, we decided to stretch our cluster uh, over uh, multiple isolated network zones and this made management way more complex and intru introduced uh, new operational issues. We wouldn't be good engineers if we didn't want to fix these mi mistakes too. By the end of 2019 we started to re-evaluate re our setup and made a decision to completely overhaul the architecture of our current Kubernetes setup again. The new setup is now based on KubeRDM alongside with some less Ansible scripts and Terraform to provision virtual machines, load balancers and so on. The new clusters are no longer stretched across different networks, which simplifies management for us a lot. 
we were a bit concerned about the operational overhead caused by the high numbers of clusters, but did a lot to improve automation, so this is not really an issue now. Uh, by the time of writing this presentation, I would say the latest uh, setup is a success. Adoption across the company grew rapidly and we are also happy with the current cluster uh, architecture. Also, since a few weeks, uh, every transaction made with our yellow EC card is handled by services which run in, in these clusters, which speaks for itself. Enough self-praise for now, we're here to talk about what went wrong. Currently, we operate and maintain 17 uh, shared clusters, varying in size between 5 to around 60 nodes per cluster. You may now ask yourself why we run uh, 17 different clusters. The reason for this is simple. It's because of our uh, highly segmented network, which means uh, we place a cluster in every network where there is enough workload, uh, which justifies the, the infrastructure overhead. Before starting with the first story, you must know a few things to understand the problems better. Of course, we deploy configuration changes and updates uh, first on our lab environment and then promote it to, to test and, and all the other environments. Nevertheless, there is always a, a shared service involved. Examples include our internal Docker registry, which is the same for all clusters, and uh, the CSI plugin called Trident from NetApp, which connects to the same storage box, independent of the, the cluster environment. Let's start with the first story where one of those shared services was involved. As I already said, we use uh, Trident to provision uh, persistent storage to our containers. There are currently two different types of storage. Uh, one is iSCSI for block-based storage, uh, which uses a normal file system like XFS, and the other one is uh, NFS, for file-based storage. Most of our applications currently use NFS uh, as a persistent storage and only a few are using iSCSI. And a small disclaimer before we start, the issue was not Trident's fault. It illustrates the, the setup with, with Trident and our uh, NetApp storage box. As you can see, there are two independent Kubernetes clusters on the left side, for example, there's a development cluster which runs its own instance of, of the Trident operator, which watches the API server for some events. And uh, for example, if someone creates a new persistent volume claim, uh, Trident receives this event and creates a volume on the NetApp storage box. Of course, the same applies to, to the production cluster on the right side. As you can see, the NetApp storage box is shared across those two clusters. And as we all know, shared infrastructure is hard and that's part of the issue we had. A normal Tuesday in August, a pod was restarted in production and was not able to attach its iSCSI disk, which of course is bad. At around 12 o'clock, a team of people noticed that they face a problem with storage on their application running on one of our production clusters. They decided to trigger a rolling deployment of a few pods which depend on iSCSI. Unfortunately, newly created pods were not able to start and they were stuck in container creating state because the kubelet or the CSI provider was not able to attach the requested volumes to the pod. Soon after that, the team also noticed that the, po uh, that the pods which were still running were not able to access or write any data to or from the iSCSI volumes. So they contacted us a few minutes later and we saw that there were quite a lot of D-state processes on some of the cluster nodes. So what went wrong? In order to understand the problem, you need to know that the NetApp storage box uses so-called iGroups to manage permissions. An iGroup is a simple mapping of a node to a list of devices the node is allowed to access. Someone from the storage team noticed that the list of uh, allowed nodes in this iGroup was, was quite short, shorter than expected. After some further in investigation, we found out that every single production node was missing in the iGroup. And due to that, access to every iSCSI device was prohibited. 
if you remember the error message you saw on the, the initial slide, this was not very obvious on first sight. But you all know, never trust error messages. What was the cause for that? How could we lose all those permissions? The answer is simple. It was a Trident update on our dev cluster. Maybe not what you guessed, and it also took us some time to find this out. You may now ask yourself how an update on our development clusters can break production. For historic reasons, all our clusters use the same iGroup named Trident. This is of course not ideal for different reasons, but was much easier on the cluster, which introduced a fancy new feature. So, the new Trident version was able to manage iGroups automatically, based on the nodes which are part of a cluster. So, Trident removed a lot of, let's say, stale nodes in this iGroup. Of course, most of these nodes were not stale. The Trident instance in the dev cluster was simply not aware of those, because they were not part of this cluster. In summary, all nodes not part of the development clusters were no longer allowed to access any iSCSI device or volume. I prepared an image for you which illustrates what happened. As you can see, a Trident instance is run in each cluster and they are completely independent of each other. But there is only one shared storage box. The updated Trident instance in the dev cluster simply removed all nodes which were not part of this cluster. In terms of Trident, this is a perf perfectly fine operation. For us, it wasn't, because all clusters use the same iGroup. So this is how we broke production by updating a component in a development cluster. In order to fully understand the issue, we had to read the Trident release notes. You can see a screenshot of the relevant note below. After reading the release notes, we were sure that this was the root cause for, for our problem. We decided to roll back the Trident update, and after that, we manually re-added all nodes from every Kubernetes cluster to the NetApp I group. Access to the iSCSI devices was now back to normal. We finally had to drain and reboot some cluster nodes, which still had uh, D-state processes left, and triggered a rolling deployment of the application in, to, to make sure everything is back to normal. As a follow-up, we changed the Trident configuration, so each, each cluster has its own iGroup to manage permissions. This is also a benefit from a security perspective of you, and of course allowed us to update Trident and benefit from the automatic iGroup management. Our second failure story was when we DDoSed our Docker registry. It began on one afternoon where a developer noted that Docker image pools are extremely slow on different cluster nodes. So what's actually going on? As an example, pulling a partial Docker image took 11 minutes for just a few hundred megabytes. Slow image pulls shouldn't be that bad, but in our case this issue affects also other services. We have a central artifact setup, which is serving Docker images for all clusters and is also used as an image proxy to external repositories. A quick test showed that all clusters were affected and Artifactory was delivering data with a slow rate. Also, raw repositories, like one where we store some ISOs, was slow. You can think of speeds around 100 kilobits per second. Usually, degraded access to Docker images shouldn't be a problem, but in our case, many of our deployments include infrastructure stuff had an image pull policy of always, which is not needed with our security model. And there was a chaos monkey, which was luckily deleting pods on every cluster, including production and it is not respecting pod disruption budgets, in order to be meaner. Also, developers were getting nervous 
as their deployments wouldn't complete and access to NPM, Maven or RPMs was not working properly. The question was, who or what is causing this outage? A few minutes later, we discovered that someone started a kubectl reboot process, which might have triggered this disruption. To give you some background information, we developed a small bash script called kubectl reboot that helps with rebooting all cluster nodes sequentially. It's mainly used after kernel upgrades. The script evolved into a kubectl plugin written in Go. There are also some timeouts for node drain and other defined actions. For each node, it checks the cluster and node state, removes it gracefully from load balancing and drains the node before reboot. Can it get worse? Yes, it can. kubectl reboot produced heavy load on Artifactory for each node that came up online again. Because the freshly rebooted nodes had nearly no pods assigned, they got many pods from the next node that has to be rebooted. This caused the freshly rebooted nodes to pull new images, and therefore it was a denial of service, and sadly not the only problem we had. And kubectl reboot continued happily to reboot even more nodes in the cluster, before the evicted pods came online. So one cluster had 400 out of 1317 non-functional pods, so roughly a third of the pods was affected in this cluster. And it gets even better. As this piece of code caused kubectl reboot to ignore pod disruption budgets, so even with correctly set PDBs, workload could become unavailable during the reboot process. As a side note, you can also find a typo on this line. To summarize the issue, we had a sequential cluster reboot process running that caused an overloaded Artifactory instance, which is shared by all clusters. This caused a slow or impossible image pull, where kubectl reboot proceeded with the reboot and caused many un unavailable pods. Even pod disruption budgets were ignored, so the mechanism is broken anyway. Our immediate action was to stop the Chaos Monkey, which runs on all of our clusters. After the reboot process was stopped, it took one hour to completely resolve this disruption. We also reviewed the image pull policy settings for our core components and improved the alerting for unwanted pod states. Also, the logic was changed to respect correctly configured pod disruption budgets. Midterm, we will rewrite this piece to an operator that will also reboot nodes randomly in a chaos monkey way. But this was not the end. We had to file twice with it. kubectl reboot had two short timeouts set for drains, so it brought down an important application on production, which has longer startup times than we expected, and we ignored the PDBs in this case. Luckily, it didn't affect any end customers. At the end, we also learned from our failures. We started to write postmortems, and they are accessible by any employee. This helps also to raise awareness of some actions. Failing is normal. We failed also with DDoSing other things, firewall issues, bugs in CNI plugins, or simply human errors. Also, things will fail at some point. We need to accept that and use mechanisms to provoke that and cope with it. Especially shared infrastructure, like in these two cases, can result in unexpected outages. Merci fürs Zuhören.
Ja, merci vielmals. Ein Applaus an unsere beiden Speakers, die ihr jetzt hier auch im, im Call seht, der Boris und der, der äh, Tom. Gibt es Fragen an die beiden? Hat jemand eine Frage? Wenn dem nicht so ist, habe ich eine. Äh, meine Frage ist, wie vermeidet man bad press? Or, yeah, I can switch to English. How, how do you prevent bad press with uh, when using uh, Kubernetes as a as core infrastructure? Möchtest du, Boris? Soll ich? Ja, mach doch mal. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, quite a good question, but I have not really. Uh, an answer on, on written down on a, on a sheet. So I would say um, the best thing we did in, in, in yeah with, with, in our journey with Kubernetes was uh, to enforce this, this principle of chaos engineering. So uh, we run a chaos monkey on each class, and I think this is one of the the, the best decisions uh, we made. It also helps us to to find a, a lot of of other problems, like uh, one problem was in a network plugin, in a CNI plugin, uh, which was uh, which caused an outage every time the, the, the container to for the, the CNI, which caused an outage every time when the CNI container is restarted. So and this we only found out because of our chaos map. So this is for me this is the most important thing. It's principle so, of chaos engineering. Yeah. What, what is, does this uh, chaos monkey actually do? What is what is the behavior of, of that one? It simply deletes pods in a, in a graceful way. It's just uh, it sends a sick, a sick term to a pod uh, randomly. I think currently it's every 20 minutes or something like that. And yeah, so the pod has, has time to gracefully terminate and uh, clean up its stuff and that's just yeah for us. Okay, but I've also seen that the first um, action you 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 made was like turning off the chaos monkey when you're running into trouble. So so why is that? Um, this was especially the case uh, in in the talk of, uh, from Boris because our factory was already overloaded, which served all our Docker images, and we didn't want to to bring down more, even more pods and. Um, and even pull, yeah, trigger a okay. more image pull. So because artifactory was already overloaded. Okay, so because you already knew the cause of this of this problem. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, you two guys. It was was great hearing from uh, the stories from from Post Finance. Uh, we will be back quite soon with uh, the next story. So stay tuned. Welcome also from our side, friends and future friends. We're going to talk about how to fail with Istio. Um, as some of you might know, we are Bespinion, a small cloud consulting agency from Bern. Uh, we work a lot with Kubernetes, uh, with uh, AWS, with other uh, public cloud providers, and so on. And we are Matis and uh, Toby. So first of all, let's delve into what Istio exactly is. Some of you might not yet know everything about it. Um, this picture should give you a quick overview. It is 
all in all, a service mesh that runs on top of uh, Kubernetes, but can also run on other platforms. But we were we are now today looking at it in terms of uh, Kubernetes service mesh. So how it works is you have at the bottom this control plane, which is newly called Istio-D, and it contains all of the management plane or control plane of Istio. And then with every service that you have running in Kubernetes, uh, it injects a proxy. So every request that comes into your cluster and that goes to a specific service will go through this proxy, and every response that comes from the service will also go through the proxy. Um, this is very helpful because you then have uh, control over all of the service mesh. So um, it, it allows you to have a lot of advantages in terms of security because you can use MTLS to uh, actually encrypt all of the traffic that goes through your service mesh. Uh, it gives you advanced load balancing on the level of HTTP or gRPC or even WebSockets. Um, and it gives you a lot of fine-grained control over, for example, which service is allowed to call which endpoint of another service because you have this strong authorization and the strong identities that are provided through MTLS. Um, so all in all, we thought it was a very good idea to have this service mess, uh, service, <laughs> service mesh in our uh, application. And we thought to, to use it in, in, the, in the way that you see here. So as you see in the title, we had a very brilliant idea to use an authorization proxy for an external VM. How this exactly looked is we had an API running on an external VM that was not part of the Kubernetes cluster, but that was actually part of the Istio service mesh. So we extended the service mesh beyond the Kubernetes cluster to some external VMs. Uh, but the service that was running on this external VM was not multi-tenancy aware. And we wanted to fix that by having an authorization proxy running on Kubernetes that would then kind of be the filter that provided this uh, multi-tenancy awareness for this external service. So what you see here on the screen is the route of the request as it would come into the Kubernetes cluster, which is uh, depicted here by this blue rectangle. And it would go into the uh, Istio ingress gateway and then to the auth proxy, which is just a normal uh, service running in Kubernetes, something that we had programmed. And then from there, it would go through the egress gateway to the external VM. So all of the traffic that comes into and that goes out of the Kubernetes cluster is controlled by these components. That was the very brilliant idea that we had. But of course, things didn't just go as expected and uh, it all blew up. <laughs> now let's look uh, quickly into uh, what exactly happened. So you can see uh, again, these three uh, components and what we had the request instead of um, being redirected from the egress gateway to this external VM that we had, we had kind of an infinite request loop because the egress gateway was redirecting the request back into the ingress gateway. So the, uh, the request was kind of doing this, this loop thing between the ingress gateway and uh, the egress gateway. Um, and we can look into that more in more detail when we look at the configurations. So first, the ingress gateway. There in Istio, you have the definition of a virtual service. Um, and you see here, it's defined on the ingress gateway um, and for the host api.bespinin.io. Now, this is just an example, but it, this would be the URL that um, is in, in a normal DNS for our external uh, VM. And then for this host, the destination would be the, the auth proxy. So that's what you see on the last line here. The, the host, uh, so the destination host is our auth proxy that runs in a namespace called prod. That's why we use this um, kind of nomenclature that is common in Kubernetes. Next, let's look at the configuration of the auth proxy itself, or actually of the virtual service that goes around it. So here we have, as a gateway definition, we're using mesh which means this uh, virtual service rule applies to anything that comes out of the mesh, which means uh, any service that, that runs in the service mesh, i.e. our auth proxy. Again, we are, here we have something that is registered to api.bespinion.io, and this time the destination is the egress gateway, um, as you see on the last line. So we want the request, as you saw in the picture before, we want it to go through the egress gateway and then from there outside of the cluster. So let's look at the uh, 
configuration of the egress gateway next. Um, here, again, it's the same picture. The gateway this time is the egress gateway. The host is the same. And now for the destination, we want the request to go to the actual VM, which we had made a DNS entry for um, that was uh, under the name of api.bespinion.io. But Istio was being smart and thought, OK, I know api.bespinion.io because it is in one of my service entries, or sorry, virtual services. So it redirected this same request back to the ingress gateway. And that's how we got this, this infinite uh, request loop. And as you saw, as you see on the next slide, this is the solution is actually very simple. We created a, a simple entry in the DNS that was different from the one that came actually into the cluster. Um, so we could point api.bespinion.io to our ingress gateway and then api-bm.bespinion.io um, to the actual VM where the service uh, actually resides, so where, where this uh, API service resides. And through that, there was no infinite uh, request loop anymore, and our request happily tra traveled through the whole Kubernetes cluster and then to the VM. It's a very simple solution, but it took us quite a while to figure that out. And the, the learnings, the main learnings for us were don't overcomplicate your mesh. I mean, in this case, we had a very complex setup of our Istio mesh where the request would go through multiple gateways and then to external uh, services, which also created these multiple routing hops that you see in the, in the second learning. So the, the quintessence is Istio had great, has great possibilities and potential to create fine-grained uh, rules and architectures and so on. But when you're actually interfacing with, with the rest of the world, uh, in our case, represented by this VM, then the old mechanisms and, and rules, in our case, it was the DNS, they still do apply. So just be aware of that when you're tinkering with all of these different possibilities that uh, Istio and Kubernetes give you, and be aware that at some point you might still need to interface with kind of more of the traditional or at least the outside world. Then I hand over to Tis. Yes, thank you, Toby. So our next um, failure story um, has to do with um, deploying legacy monsters on an Istio service mesh. And what we're presenting here is actually joint work with Eve Hanke and the Swiss Com Enterprise Application Services team. This was a, it's a failure story that um, basically arose from a project with BIT together with those folks. So the, the basic um, uh, scenario was that we had a legacy application uh, which was being supplied by uh, um, a vendor and we had already gone to quite some length to get this legacy application, which we will now call Legacy Monster, um, working on their Kubernetes. So we had to fiddle around with the, um, the um, configuration a lot and sort of fiddle around with the setup of the application to get it running on Kubernetes. However, we were still missing um, a lot of traceability. We, we didn't really have any insight of what the various components of this legacy monster were doing, with the, uh, how they were communicating. And also, we didn't have any end-to-end -end security or service-to-service -service security within the components of the legacy monster. So. Uh, we thought it would be a great idea to use Istio because Istio gives us all of those features more or less for free, right? The, the insight uh, and traceability features and also the um, fine-grained MTLS um, capabilities to do service-to-service -service authentication. So we thought, you know, uh, all we have to do now, we've, the legacy monster is running on Kubernetes. So all we have to do now is uh, um, label our namespace for Istio injection, and we'll get all of that stuff in a moment for free, right? Um, of course, um, something like this happened when we started our legacy monster again on now on an Istio-enabled namespace. Uh, the legacy monster didn't even start anymore. So. Um, Basically, that uh, situation was due to um, two problems. And the first problem was that the legacy monster was trying to be smart or was, was being smart the way legacy applications were smart back in the day. So 
what uh, we found out was that um, our traffic um, to the legacy monster container was actually reaching the Istio proxy within um, uh, the respective pods, but was not reaching the workload container itself. And we asked ourselves why this is the case. And we had a closer look at what this legacy application was doing. And we found out that um, the legacy monster was trying to be smart. It was when starting up, it was determining the IP address of the host it was running on, which in this scenario happened to be the IP address of the pod. And then it decided to only bind to that IP address when listening to uh, HTTP traffic on its main HTTP port. Now Istio on the other hand is working in accordance with the Kubernetes network model. Thus um, it basically um, instruments IP tables to uh, transparently route all traffic uh, destined to the legacy monster through the Istio proxy. The Istio proxy inspects uh, the service um, which uh, comes with the legacy monster to decide which ports to forward to, but it uses a local host as the IP address um, because basically all containers within a pod communicate um, via a coordinated port space and local host. And obviously this didn't work. So um, what did we do? Well, we went back to the drawing board and we decided that we um, could in influence the way Istio was setting up um, IP tables or rather um, we um, injected uh, an, an init container into the deployment of our legacy monster, which would add some uh, rules to IP tables to do a destination net for all traffic destined to the legacy monster, which, trans which would translate the destination address from localhost to the pod IP to let the legacy monster use um, its, its configuration that it likes to use so much. So then obviously after these insights and these fixes, we were patting each other on the back and getting ready to open the champagne. Uh, but then someone said, hey, maybe we should do a few requests. You know, it's now starting up, but just to be sure, let's let's make a few requests to the to the legacy monster. And again, everything blew up. And well, we were back to the drawing board. Our uh, legacy monster was still not working on Istio. So what was the problem then? Um, well, we found out that the, um, the legacy monster had another nice uh, little mechanism in place. Um, so it was on certain requests, the legacy monster was making requests to itself or calls to itself um, uh, using some remote procedure call protocol. And these calls were made to ports, uh, which came from a seemingly uh, from, a, from a very large port range, something like 40,000 to 60,000, but on completely implicit and random ports. Now, this is obviously also not really compatible with the way Istio does things, because if you remember, Istio um, basically makes sure that all uh, traffic destined to the legacy monster goes through the Istio proxy by instrumenting IP tables, and then inspects the service, inspects all of the port declarations of the service, of the legacy monster to figure out which ports it has to forward to the legacy monster. Now, if you have implicitly um, negotiated ports and and these kind of um, these kind of mechanisms in place, they will simply be blocked because uh, Istio has no idea what to do with this this traffic. So again, same idea or yeah, same trick. We uh, ended up creating uh, an init container. Uh, which basically added some more IP table rules, which excluded this dangerous port range uh, entirely from the Istio mechanism so that the legacy monster could continue talking to itself as it wants to, um, while um, all the other traffic is routed as expected. Now, this obviously led to the fact that this uh, internal communication was no longer under the control of Istio, um, but um, on the other hand, it's it um, got our our legacy monster to work in the end. 
So what were the learnings in this case? Well, obviously beware of legacy monsters seems pretty straightforward, right? So, but um, um, jokes aside, uh, Istio is very well suited for cloud native and uh, microservice oriented workload. Um, but beware when you're planning on moving a large legacy application onto the service mesh, you might run into all sorts of nice problems like we had. And if you do, uh, you always have um, the possibility to tweak IP tables uh, if you dare. And if you have um, some people like Eve Hanke on board of your team who are specialists and who know the internal working of IP tables very well. So those were uh, some Istio failure stories. We now want to give you a few hints and tips of tools which we used on the way to um, gain more insight into uh, what's going wrong in Istio and to fix things. Toby, I'll pass over to you again. Thank you. So the first tool that we want to introduce is Istio Cuttle, which has an analyze command. So Istio Cuttle itself works pretty much like kubectl. Um, you can use it to run different commands, but that run on the Istio level. And the analyze command actually tries to give you different um, different uh, warnings and, and errors about your current configuration of Istio that can be very helpful because, because Istio has some uh, requirements that are, in my opinion, not very intuitive. So for example, it requires you to name your service ports uh, according to a certain schema and stuff like that. And it will give you very helpful warnings about that. Um, the next thing would be Kiali, which is uh, kind of a dashboard that gives you an overview over your service mesh um, that you have within Istio. So here you see an example screenshot of uh, what Kiali might look like. It shows you all of your uh, different services and the different components. So on the one hand side, your Kubernetes components, but on the other hand, also your Istio components. And it shows you how they are connected. You can get a live view of what your requests go through and where they might be terminated or where they actually might slow down. And we grew very fond of this because when you have a complex service mesh, it is almost impossible to have a good overview over it without this, this graphical tool. Um, the next tool that we used a lot was is called KSNF. So that is actually a plugin for kubectl. And you use it in uh, how it's described here. So you would run kubectl sniff and then some pod that you would want to sniff on. And what this would give you is a TCP, TCP dump for this specific pod. So everything that goes in or comes out of this pod, it would lock in a TCP dump matter. And this you could then uh, either with TermShark or just with regular old Wireshark, wire or you could then analyze this traffic. And this helps you, for example, to determine which parts of the traffic are already encrypted uh, using MTLS or which ones aren't. Um, and just in general, it, it logs all of the, the different requests for you, um, for example, on an HTTP level or also on a TCP level. It is a bit complex to, to set up, and it has some requirements. For example, the some of the pods need to run um, in a privileged fashion. Otherwise, it's not allowed to do this TCP dump. But all in all, the usability is actually quite good, and it, uh, it helps you a lot to analyze your traffic. And then last but not least, uh, there is a tool that we at the Spinion have developed or are developing actually, which is called NetCubed or Net3. Um, we want to create this tool just as a general toolbox for debugging Kubernetes and Istio traffic on the network level. And currently this tool has two different commands. One of them is called Net3 proxy add, uh, and there's also the respective proxy remove. And this will add another proxy to your application where all of the incoming and outcoming traffic will go through. And it will very nicely and easily log all of the HTTP parameters for you. So uh, for example, the, the verb that was used, the endpoint, um, the headers, and the body of the request. And these things are usually not that easy to get, uh, except for if you're using the complex setup with Wireshark. Um, but with NetCube, it makes it actually really easy for you to 
or it just gives you one command that you need to run. You don't need to install anything on your cluster and it will show you all of the uh, in incoming and outgoing requests for a specific pod. And the second command that Netcube already has is called the topo command, which shows you the topography of one specific uh, network request. So you can give it a source and a destination, and it will show you which different components um, and uh, that of, of Kubernetes and of Istio this uh, request will go through. The Istio part of this command is actually not ready yet, but uh, we're working on this. And it's also an open source project. So we have it on the Bespinion um, GitHub site. We invite you all to contribute, be it via feature requests or via actual code. We want this to be a, a community tool that allows people who work on uh, Kubernetes and Istio to more easily know what is going on in their network and actually debug it. So these are the tools that we used to find out what the problems were with all of these issues that we had just described. And they, they were a great help for us. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and we are open to questions now. Thank you very much, you two guys. It was very, very interesting. Um, we actually do have a question from our community, uh, from Christian Jakob. How do you manage the complexity and or node deployments when using IP tables on a node level and the service mesh open that one? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, hmm. I'm I'm guessing um, I'm guessing you 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 generally don't want to mess with IP tables on on Kubernetes. So the the or or on on the on Istio side. So the um, the solutions we showed you here were sort of last ditch efforts to get this thing running um, um, but obviously if you can avoid um, doing doing um, hacking IP tables with init containers uh, I would strongly recommend or I would actually strongly recommend um, uh, not placing um, legacy workload in an istio mesh is probably is probably the more sensible answer than, than giving a, a completely technical answer to this question. Um, so, so um, we're fully aware that um, that messing with IP tables at at, at this level um, could land you in problems when um, in the scenario you're describing, Jakob. Okay, so um, from my side, a service mess. I liked that one pretty much. Uh, <laughs> is it actually a service mess? Um, do you uh, what do you think about the added complexity of using a service mesh? Is it generally worth it? You would probably say yes, but um, I mean there is added complexity. What's the trade-off? I think it kind of goes back and forth between a service mess and a service messiah. So, <laughs> um, I mean, it, th there can be huge advantages that you get out of these meshes. And sometimes you even have requirements that kind of require you to have such a thing in place. Like if you have very strong requirements towards security, you need to have something like this uh, MTLS encryption. So as long as you don't overdo it with the mesh and try to create a very complex setup from the very beginning, I think it makes sense to have these things in place because as we showed with Kiali, they also give you a great observability over your mesh and they allow you to actually debug things in a much more detailed way. So I think um, in, if, if you can, uh, if you want to work towards some of the advantages that we described that they can give you, it's well worth having a service mesh. Um, what also makes sense is to look into more simple service meshes maybe like uh, console or, or Linkerd instead of just going uh, the full path and using Istio. If you don't need any of the things that only Istio would give you, then it might make sense to, to use a simpler or a smaller, more lightweight service mesh. Thank you very much. And a great round of applause for you two guys as well. Thanks. Thank you very much. So.
So I would like to talk about um, the Swisscom, the central Git Swisscom instance, uh, the central Git instance of Swisscom, sorry for that, um, being partially unavailable. And um, we had an incident where our Git instance, our central Git instance and the use Bitbucket was partially unavailable for five hours uh, during office hours. And we have more than 3000 users. And if it's down during office hours, it's, it's not so great. Partially unavailable means that um, when you run a Git operation on it, then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And I would like to convey with this presentation a little bit of what it means to um, troubleshoot something in production um, under time pressure. So essentially my day starts on a Monday morning, I get an alert and the alert says, okay, Bitbucket is down. And as I make my way to my laptop, so I was still sleeping at that time, um, I think what could be the issue for that? Uh, could it be something with the application? Um, for example, there's an application bug that crashes, uh, that causes the application to crash. Is it something with the network? So the application is fine, but it just cannot reach the instance. Or is it something with the infrastructure? And I was actually thinking, okay, the cloud must be down because it just has to happen you know, once every once in a while. Um, could also be something with the cluster. So anyway, as I get access to my terminal, I check the pods and I see that everything seems to be all right. There has not been any recent restarts of any pods. I check the logs as well. And I do all of that from a jump host VM. The, so the VM lives in the same infrastructure as our Kubernetes cluster with Bitbuckets. Um, as everything seems to be okay with the application, I do a test, I do a Git clone. Um, and we have both SSH and HTTPS. As I do this from the jump post, everything seems to be okay there as well. And I'm starting to be a little bit puzzled on what could be the issue. So as I retry the Git clone from my local machine, um, I can see that the HTTPS one is okay, but the SSH one is not okay. So probably it makes sense that we subdivide the network part into, and you know, lacking a better name, I call this the control path. That's where my bootstrap VM is and the data path. And the data path essentially looks like this. So when users access Bitbucket, um, they go through an F5 load balancer. And given this analysis here, it's pretty clear there's something wrong with F5, right? And we used to have issues with F5 in the past. It definitely has to be F5. So I create the tickets to um, the, the networking guys and I tell them, could you please have a look um, at F5? Could you please check the logs and see if there's anything wrong because I cannot reach Bitbucket. And I can reach it through the jump post. So it must be the, the component that sits in between. As time progresses, um, a colleague uh, joins in. And well, first of all, in terms of alerting, I can see that the alert disappears. So the alert closes and it reopens again. And it closes and it reopens again. So the alert is like flapping. And um, as, a, as the colleague joins in, he writes me on MS Teams and he says, okay, but everything is okay with SSH and why are you saying SSH is not good? <laughs> so we think a little bit about this and, and then we came up, we came up with this solution essentially. Um, I, I wrote a small script that um, Git clones a repo, waits 10 seconds and repeats that cycle. And I do that both for SSH and HTTPS. And I can see that, you know, it works, it works, it doesn't work, it works, it doesn't work. <laughs> and it does the same kind of picture, the same kind of picture shows for both SSH and HTTPS. So yeah, the, the problem seems to be much bigger than anticipated. There definitely seems to be something wrong with this F5 load balancer. So finally, I get a mail back from the F5 guys and they tell me, look, F5 is okay. We have no issues here. <laughs> um, but by the way, I cannot reach the backend service. 
so I cannot reach your cluster. And for that, let's zoom in a little bit. So we have the developer. He goes to the F5 load balancer. And we are a pilot user of the Google Cloud. So Bitbucket is on the Google Cloud, on GKE, the Kubernetes engine. And since I was able to access Bitbucket from the jump host, which is on the Google Cloud, um, the application must be fine. F5 is fine, right? You just got confirmation for that. So something must be wrong on the, the, the connection between the Syscom router and the Google Cloud router. Definitely something is wrong with this data center interconnection. And as I log in to the Google Cloud console and check the traffic stats on the router, I can see that, that the traffic, you know, it implodes. Definitely something at around 6.33, much, much less traffic than usual, much, much less traffic. And I'm like, okay, definitely something wrong with that connection. So I open up, so I escalate these tickets to Syscom, to their colleagues, the networking colleagues. And I say, look, uh, something must be wrong with that interconnection. Could you please have a look? And at the same time, I create an urgent ticket for Google Cloud. And um, I tell them, please have a, have a look at this, at this um, Google Cloud router, at this interconnection. Something must be wrong. We, we're losing packets there. <laughs> and please do it quick, right? And it's already 8 o'clock, 8.20. And most developers or colleagues uh, in the company, they wake up at around seven to eight. So that's definitely the time where I start to get tickets from users. They're telling me, look, uh, something is wrong with Bitbucket. Are you really looking into that? It's already been a while. <laughs> and well, it turns out I get a, an answer back from, from the colleague and he contacts me directly on MS Teams. So we have a, a much better communication. He tells me, look, everything is OK with the network. I don't see anything wrong with the routing. There's no BGP flaps. At the same time, roughly, I get an answer from Google Cloud that tell me, hey, everything is fine with the network. You cannot see anything wrong. Are you sure you have a problem? <laughs> and in the meantime, also, all my colleagues from my team, they are available. And we do a little bit of brainstorming on that. And Chris, a colleague, he tells me, well, he essentially does an analysis on that interconnection between uh, Swisscom and Google Cloud. And he uses TCP dump for that. And he sees that the SYN packets, you know, from TCP handshake go there, but no, sometimes no acts are returned. And, you know, when I reviewed this, this slide, this is a super good example of a confirmation bias. So confirmation bias means that when you receive new information, you filter everything and you only accept the parts that reconfirm your current worldview. So two guys tell me the network is fine. <laughs> A third guy tells me, oh, there's something not good with TCP dump, with my measurements. It could be anything. But to me, it's clear it's the network, right? Definitely there's something wrong with this network, with this data center interconnection. And actually, um, we, we brainstorm again a little bit. And there's one extra piece that I haven't mentioned. So from the developer to the load balancer, there is also a firewall. It's the Swisscom firewall that sits in between. So the firewall is OK. The F5 load balancer is OK. The cluster is OK. But there's something fishy with that interconnection or not. I don't know. Two guys tell me it's OK. One guy tell me he measures something weird. Anyway, um, I'm. it's already you know, almost 11 o'clock. It's already noon. Uh, I start to get um, also a bit stressed out. And you know something is wrong with that with that connection, right? <laughs> so let's zoom in on how this looks like. Uh, we have a redundant interconnection. We have two links that go to Google Cloud. And I go back to the networking guy and say, "Look, what you measured, that's wrong. Please, please check again. Something is wrong with this network." <laughs> and he tells me, "Okay, look, uh, it could be something wrong with the redundancy setup, right? You, you, when you, for example, have a round robin setup." One link is okay, the other one is not okay. It could lead exactly to the picture that you had where some requests work or some requests don't. And he said, even though he doesn't see anything wrong with the routing, he even checked with the, the data center, uh, everything was okay there too. We do this, we take down a link. And what, it's, what it does, it actually um, uses or enables the redundancy, it just goes to the other link. And you know, as my script was still running, that was checking the, the Git checkout, 
um, it was still showing the problem. So yeah, link two is definitely the problem, right? So let's do it the other way around. Let's take link two down and leave link one. And I still have the issue. I still have the problem where there, there was this, um, this really, really weird, you know, partial unavailability. And it was, you know, almost noon. And I, I was really starting to get a bit, I was completely puzzled. I have no idea where to look further. So the network where I was convinced there was the problem was apparently not the issue. So I call in um, my team again and I tell them, look, uh, we need to find the solution. What have we overlooked? What have we not seen? And it was really interesting actually. So when you look out, this is an infrastructure view of our cluster. You see the cluster, it has an auto scaling node pool and it has a couple of pods. That's where Bitbucket runs. And we saw that there was a second node pool with a pod in the error state. So the second node pool, it turns out it was, it was created by the cluster itself. There is a setting in Kubernetes that, that well, there's different ways of, of scaling clusters, right? One is the node pool itself that can have more, of, more or less nodes. And the other one is um, cluster auto scaling. Cluster auto scaling means that you give, um, give the cluster the possibility to create new node pools. And the cluster and the first node pool are managed by us. We manage them with Terraform and we inject our settings to that. The node pool that was auto created by Kubernetes itself does not. So obviously anything that you would schedule there would not work. The weird thing was that the pod that was scheduled there, which was in an error state, had nothing to do with our application. It was nothing, it, it was some sort of system pod that we didn't recognize. But in the end, you know, switching that feature off and deleting the second node pool resolved the issue. And that was so, so weird. And to date, we actually haven't been able to reproduce this issue or to analyze it further. And the reason this happened was actually two, two entirely separate things. So one colleague, he experimented with cluster auto scaling. He wanted to see how that works. Another colleague, he had on the same cluster, he had an application running for a proof of concept, some application that someone wanted to try out. And this application must have triggered this auto scaling. So the, the combination of the two things, the, the application that was not supposed to be on that cluster and the setting being enabled caused the issue that to date we don't fully understand. But disabling it definitely, well, for, at least for this particular situation, solved the issue. And, you know, right before lunch, so really good. <laughs> and, you know, obviously some reflections on that. I think it was mentioned before, we document everything. So in preparation of this um, presentation, I just had to go back to my post-mortem. We document each individual step in the post-mortem. The second thing is you obviously want to prevent these kind of things to happen again. So we took this post-mortem into a retrospective. And when we did that, we were all a little bit puzzled because what should we do now? The next time the cluster is partially unavailable, should we go through the exact same steps? Probably not. So really having some sort of a checklist kind of solution doesn't work. What we did instead was to reflect on the process and we said, okay, it would be really good when an incident like this happens to have a sort of a, a picture like this. I mean, I draw this for this presentation, but not, uh, not at the time. And to use a more of a divide and conquer approach and say, look, you guys are gonna look uh, into this direction and the other team is gonna look into that direction to more early discover the issue. Because what I did, I went deep down into this networking issue, which was not the cause of the problem and, and ignored everything else, ignored all the signals. Another thing we did, we sort of refreshed the team rules because this happened during office hours, but imagine this would have happened at three o'clock in the morning. 
would I be able to wake up my colleagues? So we used this um, occasion to refresh the team rules and said, yes, it's okay. We can you know, call anyone at any time just to make also the expectations clear. I think that's it from my side. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you felt a little bit of the pain that I also had <laughs> during this incident. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks as well, Daniel. Uh, thanks for sharing your failure story. Are there any questions for Daniel? Um, uh, during your talk, I was wondering, is it DNS? Because I, I mean, we have we have to have a DNS fa the DNS failure story somewhere. DNS has to be the problem. So could it be DNS? I don't know. So on the um, cluster that is auto created by the by Kubernetes, DNS wouldn't work because we use our private. It's a private cluster with a private DNS. So yes, but the funny thing is nothing was scheduled. Nothing product. No, no production workload was scheduled on this new uh, cluster. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so a great, a great round of applause as well for, for Daniel for sharing his story. Thank you very much, Daniel. And we will be back quite soon. everybody. Um, I'm Oleg from Swisscom and I would like to, to share our Kubernetes journey and also fail its story. Um, usually you say I'm staying between you and beers. I assume this would be me and your <laughs> dinner time, but <laughs> let me take a bit of uh, your time to, to share our stories. Uh, shortly about our Kubernetes setup. Um, uh, Besides, we have some like uh, team uh, from PostFinance mentions that they have some networking uh, and the uh, clustering and they need to be available in every network zone because of the network segmentation. We have similar issues. That's why we have own cluster setups, which allows to uh, basically aggregate different networks in one cluster. That can be topic for another time. And we use Terraform, Poker, and, to boost, and we bootstrap it with uh, some Ansible playbooks. Uh, cluster is not naked we, because it's used by the teams who are deploying some services, doing some network operations, uh, and managing infrastructure. Uh, so we provide the rook for persistency, monitoring, Prometheus operator for monitoring, some, and DBs. It's a Postgres. Postgres, Postgres, oh, sorry, that's a mistake. Postgres is uh, stolen and some Redis and Revit MQ. Uh, I joined team not so long time ago and I was uh, amazed by their work. So shout out to my teammates and former teammates. I know he's watching. Uh, so goes to the fail story. Oh. No one presented me, so I think, okay, at least me, one. Uh, <clears throat> can be... Uh, and now story number one, uh, which comes to load balancer misconfiguration. Uh, when, when you run your standalone cluster, you would come to, to the thing how you get traffic uh, get a, a traffic into your cluster, right? There are like not so many available options when in, in talk to Kubernetes because uh, uh, yeah, usually people have some load balancers standalone up front where you can uh, Get it. In our case, we 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 switch from Kubelife to MetalLB. 
and uh, then meta ob allows you to uh, to get the uh, traffic into the cluster you have a pool of uh, free ips and then allows um, shortly about this uh, and then you have basically deployed daemon set with a speaker and speaker announce on one node when he choose one node out of all he is deployed which is basically kind of a master like role and he announced arps with uh, saying i have this uh, i have this ip so right when it comes to to distribute the traffic and so in ip in uh, ip tables uh, it uh, and the cube proxy will write it down as well uh, so the speaker is doing that, and the controller of the pod is uh, basically uh, checking. Uh, sorry, uh, mm, checking the. Uh, just a sec. Where is this button? Ah, oh, I'll try me. Just a second. Okay, sorry. <laughs> and then um, uh, that speaker will overwrite the uh, load services and pull the uh, the IP to the of the IP. Uh, uh, to to this service, so that service knows which uh, IP he has uh, of this uh, load balancer type. So then Kubernetes can uh, redirect the traffic to uh, further. In our case, we have only running this on uh, our in, uh, ingress uh, controller. So only ingress controller pods were, uh, and service were involved in uh, Meta LB. Uh, so uh, so other services just uh, get uh, uh, traffic from uh, from uh, Nginx. And so we have like two ingress controllers, one for customers, which they done, and uh, people like teams using the services, and another for uh, CD, like deployments uh, tool, and admins, which can do kubectl, uh, like uh, management uh, commands. Let's also get the clusters. And both, so basically we have a pool basic of two IPs, right? Which one assigned here on the, on the, uh, to the customer uh, con Nginx controller one is assigned to the load balance, like a management type control. Uh, this one is used further. You will see how this help us uh, in the next story a bit. Uh, so what can be get wrong? And so normally uh, the metal B, uh, that's, that's not, um, preferred way of using uh, Meta OB. Are we using layer two setup because there is a BGP setup as well. And uh, what happened here, uh, we, uh, we, I didn't configure, uh, like we didn't configure um, annotations correctly. And that's happened that the IP got swapped. Uh, sometimes he just take it randomly. So in our other cluster, it was okay, uh, test, dev, that's kind of like when we updated it, they didn't change the orders of the IP, how the IP has been assigned to load balancer right here. And uh, so in that case that uh, I, on production IP got swapped, uh, swapped, and uh, that means basically we, when the user tried to access this, he gets basically unsecure connection. The same happens to this because IP are the difference in, in our certificate. Uh, so as time was critical because it's uh, only one way to 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 cluster so there there is like um easy way to to like kind of a, a rollback a rollback would be uh easily to uh, to change nginx uh, service to external ip and that uh, just uh, do script which uh, on one of the node which does ip other and add uh, the external IPs here. And then you basically don't do mistake here. Until we uh, debug the issue, it took uh, a bit uh, until we realized that basically the, there is annotation which can be added to the configuration saying that uh, basically use only this IP which is defined in configuration, don't try to swap them or like flex the IPs. Uh, yeah, 
so once we figure out how it works and tested it uh, in different way, we, we remove this configuration and switch back to Metal OB, uh, which works pretty well since then. That's all of my first story, our first story. And sec uh, second story, it's an uh, expiration of root CA. Uh, yeah, the cluster has a, a, uh, is quite old. Like it's very really early adoption of the Kubernetes. It's, it's maybe one of the first adoption Kubernetes at Swisscom. And so root CA was uh, generated privately and it happens that uh, each uh, that's Kubernetes. I, don't put all co co uh, components, but on masters, each uh, API has a private key, which was uh, signed by this uh, 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 a certificate, which was intermediate certificate which was signed by this root CA. Same happens to the uh, uh, node kubelet and so on. And this is our actual load balancer is uh, metal B. Uh, in configuration, so it never goes to to one node or has a list of the node of IPs. It usually takes goes to also to load balancer like and redistribute the traffic here. And what's happened? Yeah, of course, uh, to when root ACA expired, uh, then it's uh, unsecure, and uh, Kubernetes uh, will not uh, like allow the communication between each other uh, from nodes to. Uh, to API server means in this time means that um, workload was not affected. So only people like teams who are using cluster could not deploy uh, to it or uh, what can happen like when the pod gets uh, uh, like uh, sometimes uh, killed or something he cannot be restarted. Uh, uh, so the guys had a smart idea to uh, to spin up, uh, like we of course renewed uh, the root CA, and uh, my team members had a very smart idea. So we spin up another masters with already renewed uh, CA. Then we update all no uh, nodes. Also, the kubelet uh, with updated uh, certificates for uh, all kubelets and those nodes. And then we restart node one by one. And in the meantime, you see here um, is that. That those masters to, to keep the quorum they were not uh, um, they were not updated just only those two so the after some failed retry the node was able to communicate to cube API and get started properly and uh, redirected so in the meantime we also updated the other um, uh, three nodes in case of production was five and seven uh, to get the um, uh, and update the configuration here. So we don't have a cluster downtime. Only, yeah, that's, uh, and uh, fortunately there were no pots which were like important for some production were uh, like failing. So after that, we, we of course had to, to fix a lot of that uh, manually also uh, by changing and deleting some uh, service account which were using the old, uh, old uh, certificates and uh, recreating them with the new one, but that was um, an easy task. Uh, what the, uh, like task, which we have been all in call. So everybody took a part uh, of that. Uh, so we had like a good ending on this story. Uh, what this uh, learning can share yet like, uh, yeah, use external load balance if you can. Metal B showed a good, uh, without much uh, basically contribution, it uh, shows uh, uh, it's pretty stable. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, like if you have some important backlogs item, they not don't get better with the time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> try to dedicate the time and uh, fix like uh, uh, don't use private root CA, but something. Uh, company wide and so on. <clears throat> At that point, I would like to say you thank you for attention and if you have a question. Thank you, Oleg, for your uh, failure stories as well, for sharing them. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, there is actually one from Dan or Christini. Would you say that debugging live in a call with the team helped? 
uh, for all stories, yes, because uh, uh, team has uh, like all of my team had a big experience, especially in the network part. So when we sit all together, everybody brings so much experience with him, and it's uh, basically we and provide some like uh, some examples which we are able to try, and that was very useful. Okay, so thanks again, and also a great round of applause for for Oleg for sharing his uh, stories. Thank you very much. And yeah, that's it. So now is dinner time. <laughs> but before that, um, we have the speaker gifts. Do you have them ready? Could you please show them? Um, those are actually the gifts who are sponsored, uh, which are sponsored by our. Um, 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 meet, virtual meetup sponsor post finance also uh, uh, again yeah. thanks to post finance as well for those for those top toblerone especially uh, personal personalized toblerone snacks and uh, yeah enjoy them <laughs>